These are my rules for building muscle. These are my rules, and there are many like them, but these ones are mine. Does that mean that they're exactly what everyone should do? No, these are what worked for me. Are they 100% backed up with loads and loads of evidence-based research? Actually, most of them are, because that's typically how I live. But there's some that are purely anecdotal with a little bit of flair of some evidence-based research to reinforce them. Bottom line is, this is what I do and the research to back it up. Number one, stimulation above all else. What does that mean? When it comes down to building muscle, we put the cart before the horse. We put the nutrition before the exercise way too often. Why? Because there's so much there to talk about, there's content for days. When in reality, I would argue that about 75% of the dose to ultimately build muscle is in the stimulus, the training itself. Without the training, the protein doesn't matter. Without the training, the carbs don't matter. Without the training, the caloric surplus doesn't matter. Stimulating the muscle is what deems the muscle relevant. So whether it's for growth or like where I am now, which is just maintenance, I can get away with a lot of a caloric deficit because I am always stimulating my muscle. I don't hardly ever miss a workout. And if I do, I find a way to keep stimulus on the muscle either way. Number two, protein at all costs. And I know I sound like a broken record and this is something you've heard a million times, but let's get real here for just a second. Protein, even if you're in a caloric deficit, can potentially allow you to build muscle. That's kind of wild, right? You can even be in a deficit and at least maintain as long as protein needs are met. The jury is still out if you can actually have true solid hypertrophy or growth in a deficit or not. It's still kind of out there. The bottom line is, don't worry about how much protein you get in one sitting. Don't say, oh man, I can only absorb 30 or 35 grams in one sitting. No, that's nonsense. There's someone by the name of Don Lehman. He's really done a lot of work in this world. And he's like Lane Norton's PhD advisor. He's an advisor to Dr. Gabby Lyon, like really solid guy when it comes down to protein. And he has made it pretty solid that we can really handle a lot more protein in one sitting than what people think. Now, what we need to understand is that no matter what, whether you're eating 20 grams or 100 grams, a good chunk of that protein is going to get oxidized in the liver anyway. Now, the rest, you still can absolutely use. Efficiency might go down. You might be more efficient at utilizing 30 grams of protein in one sitting than you are at 60 grams. But if you have the opportunity to get 50 grams of protein and you're trying to build muscle, get the 50 grams of protein, okay? That first pass elimination is gonna happen no matter what. So you might as well get as much as you possibly can. And I'll dovetail that with getting protein from whole foods is always going to be better. Now, I know that whey protein is hugely beneficial. I know that that is always going to be a thing. But whenever you can, trying to get the real deal is just going to give you the micronutrients that you need. It's going to give you the creatine that you need from red meat. It's beneficial and it comes into play. I put a link down below for ButcherBox, by the way, that's an online meat delivery company. So they've got grass-fed, grass-finished beef. The reason that I mention them is, honestly, their ribeyes, their New Yorks, and their fillets are some of the best I've ever had. And they always have really cool deals and specials going on. So I know right now they have a free ground beef for life deal going on, which is super, super cool. So when you have your order, you can get free ground beef with your delivery each month for free for a year. So that's pretty awesome. So that link is down below for ButcherBox. I recommend you give them a try if you want to try leveling up your grass-fed, grass-finished beef game. Seriously, it is a game changer, and then you don't even have to go to the store anymore because it comes right to your doorstep. I could go on and on. Anyhow, link down below. Make sure you check them out. Number three is a periodic carb bolus during a workout. Not pre-workout. I hardly ever have carbohydrates pre-workout. Personally, I don't feel good. Now, does that mean it's wrong? No, because there's lots of data to back up that having carbs pre-workout could be very advantageous. So I'm not going to go against that. But what I am going to say is occasionally, maybe once or twice a week, I'll have like some watermelon or some higher glycemic carbs during my workout. Why is this? Well, I feel like sometimes it gives me an extra oomph. But if you look at people like Professor Tim Noakes, who I've talked to about this, he's convinced that carbohydrates are really just like a, uh, a mental fuel source. In fact, you could take carbohydrates and swish them around in your mouth, and there's evidence to suggest that you're gonna get the performance benefit. So sometimes just having the carbohydrates ingested allows your brain to push you through a workout more. So does nutrition have much to do with our actual workout performance in the moment? Possibly not, but I still have carbohydrates intra-workout now and then 
because it is a safe time for me to have carbohydrates without the risk of high blood sugar because those carbohydrates get sucked in the muscle independent of insulin because of the way the muscles are moving at that time. Number four, I don't skip cardio, even if I'm trying to build muscle. Now I'll adjust my calories. Like if I go and I run a bunch and I burn a thousand calories, I'm gonna increase my calories a little bit to compensate for that because that's important to me. I'm trying to gain weight, I'm trying to build muscle. So I still factor in thermodynamics. Okay, but cardio, independent of calorie burn or calorie surplus, is good for building muscle. You increase that blood flow. You increase capillary density. You increase tissue perfusion. What that means is you get more blood delivered into the nooks and crannies of your muscles. That's more oxygenation, that's more ATP, that's more potential nutrient delivery. You definitely increase the ability to potentially build muscle by being more cardiovascularly fit. Now, again, factor in your calories there too. If you just do a bunch of cardio and you don't compensate for it, then yeah, it's gonna be hard to build muscle. Which leads me into number five. Eat more and move more. This made it on my fat loss list as well, but it works for muscle building too. It's called G-Flex, Energy Flex. It is much better for you to move a lot and eat a lot than it is to eat a little and move a lot, or in the case of trying to build muscle, move a little and eat a lot, right? That's just a recipe for slowing down and messing up your metabolism. It's always the best case scenario to keep your metabolism high, to move a lot and eat a lot. So if I'm trying to burn fat, I'll move a lot and eat a lot, but I'll be in a slight deficit. If I'm trying to build muscle, I'll move a lot and eat a lot, but be in a slight surplus. Number six jumps over to training, and that is vary all the principles. What do I mean by varying all the principles? Well, we always have intensity, duration, frequency, and volume that we should be kind of jumping around between. What does that mean? It means one week I'll really focus on higher intensity training, shorter workouts that are high intensity. Other weeks I'll focus on volume. Other weeks I'll focus on frequency, having multiple training sessions as much as I can. Other times I'll focus on duration, particularly with cardio, that really applies. But really I'm always fluctuating these because intensity, volume, duration, and frequency are the four things that are the pillars to our training. But if you do the same kind of volume or the same kind of intensity all the time, you're never, quote unquote, shocking the muscle. You have to have progressive overload in these different categories. Occasionally add more volume, progressive overload. Occasionally add more intensity or more weight, progressive overload. Occasionally add more workouts, progressive overload via frequency. Occasionally train longer, progressive overload via duration. Number seven, as a cardinal rule, and this is something I used to not do, I train to about 80 or 85% of failure. I have found that as I get into my later 30s that if I train to 95 or 100% capacity, I'm just torched. But more importantly, I run the risk of injury. And nothing, and I mean nothing, is going to hinder your ability to build muscle more than getting injured. The research is pretty strong when it suggests that we can really get a lot of benefit if we train to 80 or 85%. We don't have to train to maximum failure. Getting hypertrophy results really comes between 80 and 90%. So stop one or two reps before failure. Number eight is another training component, and that's blood flow restriction training. There's a couple reasons why I do this. BFR is real. It's not pseudoscience, it sounds like it is, but trust me, even people that like to quote unquote debunk pseudoscience, people like Dr. Lane Norton, he debunks everything, but he's been talking about BFR for a long, long, long time. BFR is real, but what isn't real is the cheap cuffs on Amazon where you just kind of willy nilly cinch them up. If you're gonna do BFR, you're gonna do it right. Get a Delphi unit, get a Smart Cuffs unit, get a B-Strong unit, something where you're actually able to measure the proper occlusion. I know that sounds complicated. I have other videos on BFR that go into a lot more detail that I'll put in the description to spare you some time. But the reason that I do BFR is it allows me to get a pump and allows me to train and get the metabolic effect on my muscle without extreme intensity. I can train at 30 to 40% intensity with BFR one or two times per week and get a similar metabolic effect and a similar hypertrophy effect as I would with a higher intensity workout. Would I only do BFR ever? No, no, I think BFR is supplemental and helps you maintain so you can have a recovery day while not taxing your body but still being able to get a stimulus. Number nine, 
And this is one that's true for fat loss too. I look at my calories over the course of a week, over seven days. Why do I do this? Because if I know that I probably should be in a slight surplus if I wanna gain weight or I wanna build muscle, I don't wanna sit there tracking calories and trying to like, see, I need to be in a 100 or 200 calorie surplus every day, sitting there weighing my food like a slave to my food, it's not fun. What I do instead is I look at my food intake over the course of seven days. It does require me to track sometimes, but it makes it so that it's easier for me to adhere. And that way, at the end of the seven day period, maybe I'm in a 500 calorie surplus for the week. Why does this matter so much for me? Well, because personally, I like to intermittent fast. Now, I was gonna add intermittent fasting to this list, but I thought that people might find it kind of weird because fasting and muscle doesn't make sense. To me, it does. But what I'll do is a couple days per week, I will fast for 18, 20 hours. Well, on those days, I'm probably not getting enough calories to really build muscle. But on the following day, I can always compensate by eating a little bit more. But if I am bound to eating a certain amount every day, that would mean I'd never get to enjoy my fasting, which I love, I love how it feels. But if I fast occasionally, then I can balance everything out so that I look at it over the course of a week. This applies with building muscle in a slight surplus, and it applies with losing fat in a slight deficit. Number 10, two grams of creatine. Don't we need more than that? Shouldn't we load? Don't we need five? Actually, a lot of research suggests that a nice effective dose is about two to three grams. Five grams works great, but for me, when I start creeping up over four, five, six grams, I start retaining water. I don't really like it. I don't really understand why entirely because a lot of the research suggests that you shouldn't necessarily retain water, but I know I'm not the only one. A lot of people retain water on it, but I find two grams, I get that nice strength benefit, but I don't retain water. And there's a recent paper that came out in 2023 that actually demonstrates with a lot of data that creatine does not build muscle. Creatine builds strength. It is an energy building supplement that allows you to be stronger and consequently build muscle. Number 11, I optimize for sleep. You are not building muscle in the gym. You know that. Come on, this isn't 2016. You are not building muscle when you eat. You are building muscle when you recover. And one of the things that I've always done is optimized for sleep. Here's a few ways that I do it. I eat a lot of fiber. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that a higher fiber diet improves sleep through the gut brain axis, through multiple different metabolic switches that occur as a result of having a diverse microbiome, okay? I also focus on light. Not red light therapy on my skin, but the light that hits my eyes. And if there's one thing that Dr. Andrew Huberman has taught to the world by his platform growing so much, is that we need to be paying attention to the light that hits our eyes. The more light that I get outside, it is like a dose-dependent equation with how good I sleep. If I am outside more and I get more light, then by contrast, I sleep better. If I'm inside all day and I don't get good light, I don't sleep good. So I treat my light like a supplement. I mean, I don't try to literally live that way, but if I don't feel like I've gotten enough, I go outside and I get that light. I also add a sauna to my life. I could have made an entirely separate 12th cardinal rule for sauna. Saunas help you sleep. There is data to back that up through what is called the glymphatic system in the brain. It helps you sleep via that pathway. It helps create intracranial pressure so that basically the brain can rest more when you do sleep. There's also a lot of evidence that suggests that it improves your growth hormone pulses. Not only right when you are in the sauna and get out, but it can improve your growth hormone pulses while you're sleeping. And you are going to get better growth hormone pulses if you get into that deep sleep within the first four hours of you going to bed. So if I use a sauna and I get a good quality first four hours, I can rest pretty assured that I probably got better growth hormone pulses. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.